When you close your eyes and picture the mysteries and mythology of the American frontier, the image of a hidden civilization more than likely never crosses the horizon, despite its prevalence in storytelling across the world. Yet the legend of lost lands dates back thousands of years of global history, saturating European folklore and oral traditions for centuries. In ancient Greece, it was the myth of Atlantis, a lost civilization and aquatic empire that once ruled the earth. Atlanteans were regarded as half-man, half-god beings with revolutionary technology. However, their city hasn't been found in the 2,000 years it's been hunted. In the United Kingdom, it was the myth of Avalon, the mythical island of Arthurian lore, where it was said the majestic sword of Excalibur was formed and King Arthur himself was healed after the Battle of Camelot. It's been the subject of quests for years, but remains a mystery. In America, it was the myth of the hidden civilization beneath Death Valley, California, a topic of mythology both from indigenous cultures and the folk tales of pioneers. For years, this was regarded as nothing more than symbolic storytelling and get-rich-quick attempts by failed prospectors looking to steer attention to the lesser explored regions of the West. And yet there was something about these stories coming out of the Mojave Desert and the oral traditions of the Paiute that hint at something more than meets the eye. Could there truly be a lost land in the lowest, hottest place on Earth? This is a deeper dive into secret cities of Death Valley, the lost civilization discovered only by a select few in the last few hundred years, only for the finders to go missing like the theoretical peoples of yesteryear. Death Valley has always been a mysterious place, dating back thousands of years when the land was inhabited by the Navarra Spring people. This was around 7,000 BC, when lakes and springs still made up a good portion of the region. Fast forward 8,800 years, and the mysteries still remain, despite the land once saturated with water and greenery transforming into one of the most desolate locations on Earth, rife with missing people and human suffering. These descriptions of Death Valley truly took hold in the late 1840s, when migrating parties first flocked to Southern California en masse. The California Gold Rush of 1849 specifically saw a huge influx of wagon trains working their way to Pacific coastlines, but not before lengthy and unlucky detours through the unrelenting desert. You see, Death Valley didn't even receive its infamous moniker until those ill-fated excursions into California 1849. Now known as the Death Valley 49ers, a large group of wagon caravans and migrating parties venturing south from Salt Lake City, Utah, were attempting to take a shortcut off the old Spanish trail when they got trapped in the arid, deserted valley. These folks, labeled as the Jayhawkers Party, were a large group of men who stumbled into Furnace Creek without the necessary means to get through the rocky impasse and survive. The party was forced to kill some of its oxen and use the wood from its wagon to cook the meat into jerky before they abandoned their supplies and walked on foot until they made contact with Mexican Californios in San Fernando. At around the same time, the Bennett Arcane Party was stuck in the desert for a month. This was after a couple of men were dispatched to leave and return with help, only for the party to mistake Panamint's range for the Sierra Nevada mountains and send their rescuers on a 300 mile trek into the unknown. The men eventually returned with help, and only one person died, but many suffered. It was after the party finally broke through the edges of the desert that one of the Bennett Arcane Party members turned around, looked at the wasteland behind them, and said aloud, Goodbye, Death Valley. In the years since, countless folks have gone missing in the same lands that once saw many pioneers suffer. While some major missing persons cases have been resolved, there have still been a handful of folks who venture deep into the vastness of Death Valley, only to vanish from the face of the Earth, if they are truly leaving Earth to begin with, that is. Of these missing folks were two men, one by the name of Dr. F. Bruce Russell, and another by the name of Dr. Daniel S. Bovey. Russell was a former physician from Cincinnati, Ohio, and Bovey was his colleague, an archaeologist with excavation experience in Mexico. In 1931, it was said that the two explorers ventured to Death Valley and accidentally discovered an entire system of tunnels and caverns located beneath the valley floor. 
the men were in the vicinity after Russell had moved out west to better his health and escape the frigid temperatures of the Midwest winters. The former physician had hopes to strike rich with a couple of mining opportunities and took to Death Valley to scope out a few mining claims. During these prospecting adventures alongside Dr. Bovey, Russell fell into a cave after sinking a shaft attached to his claim. When the dust and soil settled within the cave, Russell stood up to see that there was much more that meets the eye. Russell called up to Dr. Bovey, who quickly climbed into the cave with his colleague. Together, the men walked further into the enclave, finding a path that led to a series of tunnels and catacombs stretching for hundreds of meters in all directions. After searching the caves for hours, the two men chose one tunnel in particular that seemed different from the others. They walked deeper in that direction until they were shocked to find the mummified corpses of three giant-like male creatures, all estimated to be around eight to nine feet tall. These giants were dressed in the remains of garments, resembling average-length jackets and knee-length trousers. At first, the men thought these garments were made of sheepskin dyed gray. However, it didn't take long before they realized the material was not something they had ever seen before and believed they had been made from the skin of an animal never previously seen. In other parts of the tomb, Russell and Bovey discovered additional diverse artifacts that could be best described as having Egyptian or Native American origins. These artifacts were then surrounded by strange markings, again compared to the hieroglyphics of ancient Egypt. Whatever civilization had lived in these Death Valley caverns, the pair of explorers were certain that they had just stumbled upon the burial place of the society's rulers and tribal hierarchy. Russell and Bovey knew they had to keep exploring and continued through the catacombs, finding a ritual hall near the mummified remains. The hall contained more bizarre artifacts, but even more striking was the perfectly intact remains of large animals, such as dinosaurs, elephants, and various big cats. Later reports would suggest these were the bones of creatures often associated with the Ice Age, such as woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. When Russell and Bovey realized they needed to leave the caves before dusk, they counted all of the different junctions and estimated there were 32 unexplored tunnels, and altogether they constituted 180 miles of Death Valley, stretching all the way north into the tip of Nevada. In the following days, weeks, and months, Russell and Bovey would tell their tale of the Death Valley Giants to anyone who would listen. They attempted to share their exploits with professional archaeologists too, but they were the first to wave off the men's story as mere fiction. Their reasoning focused on the suggested discovery of dinosaur and prehistoric creatures' remains. They explained that these two species never coexisted on Earth, with dinosaur rule ending 10 to 13 million years before the saber-toothed tigers and mammoths roamed North America. The pessimism from the archaeological community didn't dissuade Russell, however, as he teamed up with a money-led corporation called Amazing Explorations Incorporated, who financed further expeditions into Death Valley to find the hidden catacombs. Unfortunately for everyone involved, the Death Valley terrain had changed over the months and years due to shifting sands and relentless wind. The original entrance couldn't be tracked down by either Russell or Bovey, and the expeditions were eventually called off. In the aftermath, Dr. Bovey retreated from the public spotlight and cut off his relationship with Dr. Russell, disappearing into irrelevance. It is unknown what happened to him. However, most believe he went to start a new life in another part of the country. Dr. Russell's fate was much more obscure. After losing everything he had, Russell continued on with his own personal mission to rediscover the giants of Death Valley. On one such lonesome escapade, Russell never returned home and wasn't heard from for days. A few months later, his personal car was discovered in a remote section of Death Valley, its radiator burst. Investigators searched the car and found only his suitcase, unable to pick up a trace of the former physician turned explorer in the aftermath. Dr. Russell was never seen or heard from again, but luckily, his impassioned story lived on when a man named Howard E. Hill told the tale to the Los Angeles Transportation Club in August of 1947, which was then adapted for the press 
in a story that ran in a small San Diego newspaper. The story didn't go unnoticed this time, as some of its readers realized the tale matched very closely to an incident written about in a book called Death Valley Men, written by former prospector Burke Lee. Not only was the book mirroring the experiences of Russell and Bovey, but it had been published in 1932, just one year after their discovery and public appearances with archeologists. The story in Death Valley Men again followed two men, this time by the names of Jack and Bill. Jack and Bill were traversing an area of Death Valley known as Wingate Pass, when one of the men fell into an old mine shaft and landed in a tunnel. The man called down his partner and the two proceeded to walk through a 20 mile stretch of tunnels that led northbound through Death Valley subterrain, directly into the Panamint Mountains. At the end of one of these tunnels was a tomb, much like the tomb Russell and Bovey wandered into, featuring the mummified remains of ancient warriors wearing armbands and holding spears made of gold. What separated Jack and Bill's ancient room from the catacombs Russell and Bovey found was the intricate lighting system that existed in the caverns. Jack and Bill said that there were lights that were operated from being fed subterranean gases, casting a green-yellow glow over the rooms. One of these rooms contained vast amounts of treasure, including solid gold statues, pristinely polished furniture, gold bars, precious stones, and stone vaults filled to the brim with old currencies. Near the heavy stone doors to the room were stone wheelbarrows, balanced perfectly by counterweights and undisturbed for decades. Knowing they couldn't leave without something to share with the rest of the world, Jack and Bill grabbed a few of the treasures and artifacts and sought another entrance to the tunnels. They walked through a few more catacombs before finding an exit through some rocks in the Panamint Mountains. The two men made it all the way back home unharmed and in one piece, their hall of artifacts still in tow. However, at some point over the next few nights, one of their mutual friends broke into their homes and stole these valuable treasures, never to be seen again. Without much evidence, Jack and Bill were unable to convince local archeologists of their find but they were told if they could find proof of the tunnel's entrances, they would see an official team to Death Valley and excavate the catacombs. Much like Russell and Bovey, when Jack and Bill returned to the mountains and desert sands, they found the terrain was too far altered to retrace their steps. Making matters worse, Death Valley was struck by an incredibly rare rainstorm around the same time, all but sealing the fate of the underground revelation. Not giving up hope, Jack and Bill made plans for at least one more trek into the Panamint Mountains to find the slit in the rocks they slid out of after taking the treasure months prior. However, they were last seen at the foot of the eastern face of the mountains and never were communicated with again. A secondary search and rescue attempt was made to find the men's remains, but no such discovery was made and their story was left to be told secondhand by Bork Lee. Many wondered if Lee's account told in Death Valley Men was a work of fiction inspired by the memoirs of Dr. Russell and Dr. Bovey a year prior. It wasn't until more curious folks, privy to both stories, pointed out that an even earlier Death Valley discovery shared many parallels with the two tales, this one coming in the 1920s. The story, once again, remains mostly the same. A prospector known only by the name of White told his fellow Southern California folk of an abandoned mine near Wingate Pass, the same area Jack and Bill were known to frequent 10 years later. White said that this specific line shaft was the gateway to a complex labyrinth of tunnel systems stretching through Death Valley's underground. When he ventured through the tunnels, White said he found catacombs, this time filled with hundreds of mummified remains, covered with leather, instead of just a few. White also spoke of treasures sparkling under the yellow-green glow of subterranean lights, emanating from caves further down into the labyrinth. Unlike Jack and Bill, however, White did not attempt to leave the catacombs with any of the forsaken treasure left on the cavernous floors. He was able to return to the Wingate Pass entrance, once with his wife and once with a fellow prospector named Fred Thomason. The accounts of Mrs. White and Mr. Thomason are unknown, but White's story in general wasn't ignored by everyone who took the time to listen. One such believer was a man named Tom Wilson, a member of the Paiute and an active trapper's guide, 
whose family history gave him more optimism than most. Wilson frequently spoke about his grandfather's exploits in Death Valley years ago, before the turn of the 20th century. According to Wilson, his grandfather had also discovered an underground tunneling system that eventually led him to an entire subterranean city. The city was filled with fair-skinned folks of a more European background, speaking a language unknown to Wilson's grandfather. Their clothes resembled leather, like the mummified corpses were wearing in the rendition told by the prospector White. These people of the secret city rode horses throughout and ate food never before seen on the surface of the earth. Most peculiar of all was their subterranean lighting, mechanisms all featuring a distinct yet pale yellow-green glow, just like the explorers found years later. When Tom Wilson's grandfather returned above the crust and ventured back to his village, the rest of his tribe refused to believe the story, shrugging it off as nothing more than a fantasy concocted by the old man on his journeys into the desert. Of course, the man's grandson wasn't so quick to push his grandfather away, and Tom Wilson was a believer from that day forth. Wilson held on to the tales of Death Valley's underground city all the way until he met the prospector called White, who shared many of his grandfather's stories despite never meeting the man. White then agreed to take Tom Wilson and a few amateur archaeologists to Wingate Pass in search of the tunnel's entrance, but as fate would have it, the terrain gave way to Mother Nature. White and company were left circling the desert out of desperation, and eventually found what they thought was the golden mine shaft. However, they entered the tunnel only to find it was a dead end carved into solid rock, and the men were left defeated. Tom Wilson couldn't shake the coincidences of White's alleged discovery and his own grandfather's misadventures in Death Valley, and continued to search for the lost city until he died in the late 1960s. Interestingly enough, Wingate Pass was eventually closed off to public access as it was overtaken by the China Lake Naval Weapons Center in 1942, effectively ending any sort of civilian-led escapade back to search for any underground civilizations. While the efforts to relocate the treasure troves and catacombs of Death Valley have dwindled over the years, many are still intrigued by the possibilities that a lost civilization does exist beneath the sands of southeastern California and southern Nevada. To get a better understanding of what exactly might be lurking beneath Death Valley's surface, one must go back to the earliest tale of such a place existing, the major through line being an old Paiute legend dating back centuries. The Paiute legend is known as the Kingdom of Shinoav, translated to Ghostland or God's Land in English. The story of God's Land begins with a former Paiute chief mourning the loss of his wife, struggling to process this grief and climbing out of his pit of melancholy. The chief was so embattled by his loss, he decided he no longer wanted to continue on with the life he had left, figuring a world without his wife wasn't worth the fight. He sought to find the land of the dead, where he would enter with his earthly body and find his wife's spirit to return her to the living realm. As a result, the chief wandered into the desert and prayed to the spirits of various Paiute figures, asking for guidance and strength as he entered underground caverns filled with trials. The further the chief descended into the subterranean worlds, the harder his quest became. He was confronted with demonic creatures and undead beasts, roaming the tunnels with malice and terror. The chief managed to avoid the evils lurking in the shadows and came to a brilliant light source at the end of the labyrinth. Before the heavenly glow was an incredibly thin bridge hanging over an endless chasm, a bridge the chief must cross if he was to reach the end of his quest. He looked forward, catching a glimpse of the spirit realm's luscious greenery and open meadows. The chief knew he had no choice. He was so close to his dream, so close he could smell the fresh, crisp air despite the stale atmosphere of the caves. Taking a long breath, the chief slowly but surely inched his way across the rock-formed bridge, arriving at the other side in one piece, and finally entering the kingdom of God's land. Upon his arrival, the chief was greeted by a Paiute maiden, one of the daughters of the Great Spirit. The maiden took the chief by his trembling hand and guided him towards a grand amphitheater, 
an outdoor stage where celebrations were held aplenty. In the middle of the scene were hundreds upon hundreds of Paiute spirits dancing happily in a large circle, glee and joy unmistakable on their faces. The chief took solace in the dead's unrelenting gaiety, but was quickly struck with a horribly intrusive thought. How could the chief locate his wife amongst such massive crowds of fellow Paiute spirits? The chief leaned over and asked the spirits maiden this very question. The maiden responded with one simple direction. Wait at the edge of the dancing circle and watch until his wife appears. Then he will be able to go on by her side. The chief was surprised at the sheer ease of the task and started to enjoy his time in God's land, happily accepting all of the food and drink the maiden would return with as they watched the spirits dance. It was just as the maiden left the chief with his mission that she introduced one final caveat. The chief was carefully instructed to take his wife as soon as he saw her and carry her back the way he came, without either one of them turning around to take a second look behind them. The chief hastily agreed and proceeded to spend the next few days sitting patiently at the edge of the dancing circle. He grew frustrated as the days went on and his wife still did not appear, but he never gave up his faith that she would eventually show up. The chief's faith was ultimately rewarded as after thousands of Paiute spirits walked past, including the chief's finest friends and devilish enemies, his wife walked out from the crowd. The chief ran to her and the pair embraced Years of grief and mourning were versed in seconds. The chief then took his wife by the hand and guided her back towards the bridge that led back into the underground labyrinth from which he came. The Paiute couple was able to cross the chasm successfully, but the chief had one final thought nagging him as they moved towards the tunnels. He needed to take one little glance back. A little glance back is exactly what the chief did and he turned to see the breathtaking meadows and jubilant celebrations one final time. As he did, the chief quickly realized he was alone once more, his wife nowhere to be seen. He called out for her between the cavern's walls, but the effort was all for naught. He had disobeyed the maiden's final orders, and all he had left to show for it was the memory. Still, the chief decided to return to his tribe despite the second loss of his wife, hoping to tell his fellow Paiute of the incredible wonders of God's land and the spirit realm at large. He arrived home and shared his stories with all who would listen, detailing the underground city with as much details as he could muster. In the end, he told the others to carry on the oral tradition and pass it down across generations so that future Paiute might know of the valley's inner beauty. It appears the chief's wishes came true as the legend of God's land and the mysteries hiding beneath the deserts of Death Valley continue to adapt into today's time. Who knows? As far-fetched as it may seem, the stories of Dr. Russell and Dr. Bovey, or the tales of Jack and Bill, or the endeavors of White and Tom Wilson might be more than fiction. It may be hard to believe without proof, but if enough accounts come together over time, we just might be able to uncover the secrets hidden within the most desolate places along the frontier.